Okay. I want to ask the question again now. What does the sovereign give up? Yeah. I mean, it's a, insofar as he, what was it? Uh, he, he has the right, I think he still retains most of the right nature insofar as only he provides for the condition that the people gave up their right of nature to begin with. What was the condition on which we agreed to give up our right of nature? It was conditional. Everybody else did. So what did the sovereign agree to? Protect us. Hmm? So more or less protect us. He gave up his right to any other thing in nature. It's supposed to be pursuing our desires and things on. So like how is our right to take control? Okay, I mean I'm tempted now to reread the passage that I just read to her and see whether Hobbes says the sovereign gives up anything at all. Because the answer is, I don't give anything up. Yes. Yet, all of us, each of us, on condition that everybody else does so as well, agrees to give up our right of nature to the sovereign. The condition is not that the sovereign promised to do anything. The sovereign is not party to the covenant. We covenant with each other to give up our right of nature. We, and, and if we all do, then we transfer our right, of, our right of nature to the sovereign. I mean, it's a little bit odd because that by transferring our right of nature, we make the sovereign. Because he's not sovereign until he gets out of our rights of nature. But we transfer our right of nature to somebody who then is, is then authorized by all of us to act in our name. We are the authors of whatever it is that the sovereign judges or causes to happen. We're responsible because we transfer our right of nature to it. So um, anybody remember the vocabulary? So we were talking about some vocabulary about contract, what that is, and a covenant is a specific kind, and uh, um, we can abandon our right of nature. There was one word that, one phrase for receiving something unconditionally. But I remember that that one? The gift, the free gift. So from the point of view of the sovereign, from the point of view of, of the person who becomes sovereign, all of these rights of nature from everybody else are simply free gifts. So think about one, one, one second. So think about the implication of this. This means that we all give up all of our right of nature. So we're no longer able to what? Judge for ourselves what's valuable based on our desires, nor act on the basis of our judgment about what's Valuable. We have to simply accept what the sovereign judges to be good and act on the basis of the sovereign's judgment. So we give up our right of nature. And I just said the sovereign does not. So what's the implication of that? That the sovereign still has his right of nature and also everybody else's. Okay, so we'll see why Hobbes wants to insist on this, because he does insist on this in a minute. But let's just think one more step through. Uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead um, what's going to be on my slide in a, in a minute. Um, but what can we say now about the sovereign if the sovereign hasn't given up his right of nature? He's still kind of in a state of nature, that's true, but what, else, what, 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 what can we say about his conduct? Because he's sort of in a state of nature. He's not subject to any sort of objective justice. He's not subject to any kind of constraint at all. Nothing the sovereign can do, it can be properly described as unjust. Because he still has his right of nature, and injustice 
is the violation of a valid covenant of which he has not made any. Okay. So, as I say, we'll see in a, in a minute. I mean, this is, this is, Hobbes really thinks this. I'm not, I'm not trying to draw out implications that he wouldn't recognize. He sees this and insists on this. We'll see why in a second. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just understand the key, you know, that kind of person. And some people put that together and said, I want this person to be representative for this person who just tends to be representative of our thoughts and ideas, and we therefore now you know, give up all the rights to this thing. And then this thing does not do what it's told or wants. You know, it disappoints people. Can they go back and take it? Well, technically they can. can. What's going to happen then? Well, so. What Hobbes would say about this is they might, they might in fact do that, but they have no right to do that. Um, so, I mean, so this is to anticipate just a little bit. Um, if we enter into a contract, you and I, and there's no deceit or fraud, we exchange what we promised each other, and then you have regrets later on. The, the thing that you bought is not all you had hoped it would be. So a you can't just come and take it, take the thing back for it. You, you gave it up. You transferred your right. Um, what about if the sovereign um, actually does want to violate the inalienable rights? This is a very good question. And we don't have to worry a lot about it. So, so um, depending on how far we get today, we'll talk about that, I hope, quite a bit. On yeah. uh, I just had a question about the whole creation. So how would you be able to tell once you're in this that everyone else is continuing to abide by this? How could you tell when someone is simply accepting the consequences and when they have taken back the right of nature so that you have the right to take back This is a good question also. So, um, I mean, he didn't quite put it this way, but, I mean, Hobbes doesn't really think that it's a problem to see whether other people are complying. But what you're pointing to is we can't see the reasons why other people are complying. We don't really know whether they've maybe instituted a moral solution and are changing the way they're reasoning or merely a political solution. We don't know, we can't see from their behavior whether they are actually accepting the third law of nature or are simply complying with it because of the threat of punishment. Yeah, this is a good point. Somebody else. Yeah. Well, no, I was just thinking, uh, does Hobbes explicitly say that everyone contracts with everyone? Yes. The covenant isn't, isn't that not what happens because there's a bunch of different sovereigns? Um, different like geographical areas. Sorry, say that again. So he says everyone contracts with everyone, but there's a bunch of different, I guess, countries. Right. It's not, it's not, pretty, it's not every. Right, right. Yeah. So, so he certainly means in a certain territory. Right? In, in the certain region, everybody covenants with everybody else. I mean, he. So if you sound so like, like the border, isn't it kind of arbitrary? Like, why does one sovereign. Yes. Follow the border of New York yes. and Pennsylvania? Yes, there is a degree of arbitrariness here. Um, so, good. Um, let me, I mean, he didn't worry about that so much. And, you know, you can like blame the fact that there weren't airplanes back then. Right? There wasn't <laughs> um, easy travel over long distances. Right, right. So he's assuming, I mean, he's sort of assuming that more or less you're dealing with the same group of people, the same people are a threat to, to each other. Um, and so people on the other side of the world really can be indifferent to. Um, but, and, and so we can get different commonwealths structured based on proximity and who actually is interacting with them. Um, but the point about the border is a good one. The point about the border is sort of something we'll talk about um, a little bit later, and then there is some arbitrariness, and uh, maybe maybe 
I'll leave this now. Remind me later on <laughs> to say something about that. Because I think there is some arbitrariness based on the fact that for Hobbes, what matters is a kind of equilibrium of stability. So it doesn't, maybe I said it this way, it doesn't really matter for Hobbes which commonwealth an individual is a part of, as long as they're part of a stable one. I just, I mean, that's what I'm just going to add, because it seems like for Hobbes' purposes of sort of finding a political philosophy of preventing civil war or creating a stable state, all it does is create a bunch of states that just have natural right to kill each other. Different states. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, all right, so, so, so he did mention that the fact that there are multiple commonwealths globally means that there's a kind of global state of nature. That's right. Um, right, so somebody living on the border between France and Germany, and for Hobbes, they should go with whichever side is going to stabilize relations best. And it doesn't really matter so much which one. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a family vote? You know, everybody gets uh, the rights, you know, everything. But in yeah. this case, not, even though it's only one thing for a person, but it's still not everything. So not everybody gives up their rights. There's only that one thing. That the sovereign. Right. right, right, the sovereign, that's right. The sovereign is not a subject. So it's just it's an exception. That's, that's the exception that is, is the point. I mean, so think back to what's causing this whole problem. I just said it before. And that is the fact that each individual is relying on his or her own